Hi students, I am Dr. Gayatri and uh, today we are going to discuss about Trauma and Emergency Part 2. So in today's uh, session, we are going to discuss about craniofacial and neck trauma first. So this includes trauma to the cranium, that is trauma to the head, that is uh, injuries to the scalp, injuries to the bones that cover the brain and injuries to the brain tissues. Next, there's trauma to the face. This includes trauma to the facial bones, trauma to eyes, nose, ears, teeth, and the soft tissues in the face. Next, we'll be discussing about trauma to the neck. So when the neck is injured, uh, it will cause damage to a lot of organs that are there in the neck, like your cervical vertebrae, spinal cord, soft tissues in the neck, pharynx, larynx, trachea, esophagus, then endocrine glands like thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland. Right, so first we'll see skull. So skull consists of two things. One is the cranium, that is the part of the skull that covers the bones that cover the brain. Next we have the face. So face is made up of facial bones. If you look at this picture, you will see this is the cranium. The bones that cover the brain. And this is the face. So face is made up of facial bones. First we'll see the cranium or the head. So this includes the bones that cover the brain. So uh, the bones in an adult skull are fused. They can't move freely. But when it comes to a fetus, that is when the baby grows inside the mother's uterus at the time of delivery, you f the bones are not completely fused. So you find uh, unfused areas uh, at the fusion of the frontal suture with the two, uh, the frontal bone and the two parietal bones. So this is called the anterior frontonale. So this is a diamond shaped. Uh, soft area in the fetus's skull at the time of delivery. So behind, uh, at the fusion of occipital bone with the two parietal bones, you find another uh, soft part in the fetal skull. So this is called the posterior frontonale. So this anterior frontonale and the posterior frontonale, which we find in the fetus at the time of delivery, helps the fetus to be born through the birth canal. That is, the birth canal is a very narrow passage. So in order to pass through that, the fetus's head circumference has to reduce. So this becomes possible because of the presence of frontonale at the place of which the skull bones can overlap with one another. So this is called molding of the skull. So, because the skull bones are not fused in the fetus, uh, the skull bones can mold during delivery. So, this helps to reduce the head circumference and thereby facilitate childbirth. So, after birth, these frontonales, they are fused within a few months time. Both the anterior and the pro posterior frontonale are completely closed and thereafter in the skull, the bones are not mobile. Bones are not movable once the anterior and the posterior frontonales are closed. So that's about the skull. Now we'll see the face. So face is made up of facial bones. So here you can see the forehead region of the face. That's made up of frontal bone, the part of the skull cap or the calvarium. And then you have the face made up of facial bones. So the nasal bone helps in formation of the nose, then cheeks are formed by the zygomatic bones, then you have the maxilla and the lower jaw. Upper jaw is made up of the maxilla and the lower jaw is formed by the mandible. So out of these bones which make your face, remember mandible is the only movable bone. So this mandible is connected to the uh, other parts of the 
uh, crania at the temporomandibular joint. You call it TMJ. So this temporomandibular joint lies just in front of the ear. So at the temporomandibular joint, this mandible is connected to the cranium. This is the only movable part in the face, only movable bone in the face. Right, so now we are going to discuss about trauma to the cranium. So this is commonly called head injuries. So head injuries include trauma to the scalp, trauma to the bones that cover the brain and the trauma to the soft tissues in the brain. So this is called when the brain tissues are damaged, this is called traumatic brain injury, TBI. So we are going to discuss about each of these injuries. So first we'll see trauma to the scalp. So the commonest form of trauma to the scalp is the scalp laceration. Now if you look at this picture, you will get an idea what scalp lacerations are. So these are all scalp lacerations, right? Now the scalp has got a very rich blood supply. It has got a bl good blood supply and therefore whenever there is a scalp injury like a scalp laceration the scalp uh, the injury can start to bleed profusely so this can be dangerous and therefore whenever there is a scalp laceration we have to apply a head bandage a round bandage has to be applied to control bleeding before transferring the patient to the hospital and at the same time you have to uh, take care not to apply too much of pressure in order to control this bleeding and if you have applied the bandage once and it has become soaked with blood then what you should do is you have to apply a second dressing over the first dressing in order to control bleeding and then the patient has to be transferred to the hospital without any delay. So that is how you manage scalp lacerations. Now if you look at this picture you will see this is how the head bandage is applied. The dressing is applied for scalp lacerations to control bleeding. Now we will see trauma to the bones covering the brain. So this is commonly co called skull fractures, right? So here are some causes for skull fractures. When the skull or when the head is hit with, a, with an object, say an iron pole, right? When you fall from a height and you hit your head on the floor, then in motor vehicle accidents, in motorbike accidents, Right? When your head hits on the floor, then, or when you, uh, or when you're uh, crossing the road, uh, when you are knocked down by a vehicle and you hit your head hard on the floor or on the vehicle, then uh, it can cause skull fractures. So this is fall from height, motor vehicle accidents, mobile ac uh, motorbike accidents so all of these can give rise to skull fractures so if you look at this picture you will see these are different uh, types of skull fractures here you can see the fractures on the skull this is a depressed fracture you can see uh, the fractured segment has gone in so there's an inward drawing of the depressed fracture segment so this is called a depressed fracture so there are uh, these are pictures of fractures. Now we will see how the skull fractures are diagnosed. The first thing is the bystanders will give you a history or sometimes even the patient if he is conscious enough he may give you uh, a history of what has happened to him. So this will give you an idea as to uh, the type of injury that it is a skull fracture. Then depending on symptoms and signs and the most reliable is the imaging studies, that is the x-rays which you take, which will show you uh, that there is a bony deficit in the skull. So that is how, uh, where there is a bone disfiguration in the skull. So that is 
how you diagnose skull fracture. Now, whenever there is a skull fracture, obviously there will be a deformity in the skull. Then, if you do take an x-ray, you will see that there is a crack in the skull, indicating there is a skull fracture. Then, when there is a skull fracture, uh, it can cause bleeding. Now, beneath the skull, you have brain tissue. Uh, beneath the skull, you have three meningeal layers that surround the brain. And then you have the brain matter. So whenever there's a skull fracture, it can damage these meningeal layers as well as sometimes the brain tissue. So it can start to bleed. So this blood will track down to the eyes. So this will make pooling of eyes or tracking down, uh, pooling of blood or tracking down blood into your eye region. So this is called raccoon's eyes or panda eyes. And then... In, especially in case of basal skull fractures, your uh, blood can track down behind your ear, closer to the mastoid process. So this is called battle sign. So these are all features that help you to come to a diagnosis of skull fracture. And the most definitive diagnosis is imaging studies, that is to take x-rays. So these are x-rays which shows, now here you can see compared to this side, there's a bony deficit. So that is a fracture. So x-ray is the most definitive uh, diagnostic test you can do to uh, diagnose a skull fracture. Now we'll see injury to brain parenchyma. So injury to brain parenchyma, that is injury to brain tissues, is commonly called traumatic brain injury or TBI in shortened form. Now there are two types of brain parenchymal injuries. One is called primary brain injury. The other is called secondary brain injury. So primary brain injury is this. Now as at the time of the injury, if your brain tissues are damaged, that is called primary brain injury. Now, there may be certain other brain injuries. At the time of trauma or at the time of the event, your brain tissues are not damaged. That is, there is no primary brain injury. But uh, as a consequence of uh, the event, certain things will take place inside your uh, body which will cause injury to the brain tissues later on. So this condition is called secondary brain injury. So remember, uh, at the time of injury when your brain tissues are damaged, you call it primary brain injury. At the time of the injury when your brain tissues are not damaged, but later on as a consequence of events that occur after the incident, if your brain tissues are damaged, this is called secondary brain injury. So example for primary brain injury is brain contusion. There will be bleeding on the surface of the brain as a result of direct injury to your brain tissues. Secondary brain injuries, examples are injury to your brain as a result of increased intracranial pressure or cerebral edema or brain hypoxia. So these are the two different types of brain injury. Right, so now we'll see some mechanisms of traumatic brain injury. So here are some mechanisms. Acceleration injuries. Acceleration is now when a moving object comes and hits your uh, non-moving head. That is called acceleration injuries. For example, you may be standing still. Uh, someone comes and hits your hits your head with a with an iron pole so this is an example for acceleration injury then we have deceleration injuries that is uh, when the moving head goes and hits on a stationary a non-moving object the type of injury uh, the mechanism of injury is called deceleration injury next we have acceleration deceleration injuries that is when a moving object uh, comes to a sudden stop. Say your 
traveling in a vehicle and suddenly the driver applies brake and the vehicle stops immediately. So this is an example for acceleration, deceleration injuries. Then you have cope injuries and counter cope injuries. Now this is something to do with how your uh, brain matter moves inside your cranial cavity. Now in case of an injury, if the brain matter uh, first hits the wall on its on the same side and then goes and hits the opposite side uh, that is called cope injuries when the brain matter directly goes and hits the opposite wall of the skull in case of an accident in case of a head injury these are called counter cope injuries next we have penetrating injuries what do you mean by penetrating injuries? When uh, you hit, when when you hit the head with something, an object. If this object uh, fractures the skull and pierces into your brain matter, this is called penetrating head injury or pen penetrating uh, brain injury. So now we'll see some types of brain injuries. So, all. Now, these acceleration injuries, deceleration injuries, acceleration, deceleration injuries, penetrating injuries, and counter cope and cope injuries. These are the different mechanisms by which your uh, head injuries can occur. So, now we'll see some examples for these different types of brain injuries. So, we have concussions, contusions intracranial bleeding bleeding into your brain parenchyma and then there may be bleeding due to some other medical conditions other than trauma to your head so first we'll see concussion what do you mean by concussion now concussion is when there's a blow onto your head from outside your brain tissues are not physically damaged if you uh, if you uh, view your brain tissues by imaging studies you will see there's no damage to your brain tissues but there's a transient uh, alteration in your brain function or there may be a temporary uh, loss of brain function without any uh, physical damage to the brain tissue so this is what you call concussion so when there's a concussion there will be confusion there will be uh, temporary loss of memory and sometimes the patient can become unconscious but there's no damage to the brain tissues then if you see contusions what are they now contusion is when your brain tissues are physically damaged if you view the brain tissues by imaging studies you will see the brain tissues are actually damaged so this damage could be a long lasting damage or sometimes even a permanent damage to the brain tissues so there will be bleeding and swelling in the brain uh, then there will be this bleeding will cause an increase in the intracranial pressure so a lot of complications are there so that means contusions are more dangerous compared to concussions because in contusions actually the brain tissues are damaged whereas in concussions there is no uh, physical damage to your brain tissues it is just a transient alteration uh, in the brain function next we'll see intracranial hemorrhages what is that bleeding into your brain tissues this is what you call intracranial hemorrhage or intracranial bleeding so here what happens is whenever there is a damage whenever there is a laceration of the blood vessels in your brain or whenever there is a rupture of the blood vessels in the brain it will start to bleed so not only the blood vessels in your brain now surrounding the brain we have three layers of meninges we have the dura mater, arachnoid mater and the pia mater from outside to inside. So whenever, now they also have got uh, blood vessels in between them. So whenever the blood vessels in these meninges or in the brain 
when they are damaged it can cause bleeding into your brain tissues so this is what you call intracranial hemorrhage a hemorrhage inside your uh, cranial cavity so depending on the location of the bleeding we give them different names for example if bleeding occurs outside inside the skull bone but outside the dura mater this is called epidural hemorrhage if bleeding occurs below the dura mater this is called subdural hemorrhage if bleeding occurs inside the brain tissues this is called intracerebral hemorrhage so bleeding can give rise to hematoma formation because now you have the skull you have the scalp that is the skin covering the skull bones then you have the skull then beneath that you have the meninges and the brain so whenever there is a um, bleeding inside your cranial cavity if there's no opening in your brain that is if there's no open skull fracture the blood can't go out so the blood will be there in, in your brain tissues so this accumulation of blood within the brain tissues is what you call hematoma formation so this bleeding can lead to hematoma formation so if you look at this picture now this shows the three layers of meninges so you have dura mater the outermost layer then you have the arachnoid mater and then you have the pia mater lining the brain uh, lining the brain so uh, if bleeding occurs outside the dura mater in between bone and the dura mater this is what you call epidural hemorrhage if bleeding occurs between dura mater and arachnoid mater somewhere here this is what you call subdural hemorrhage if bleeding occurs below that especially into your brain this is what you call intracerebral hemorrhage so bleeding beneath the skull outside the dura mater is epidural hematoma bleeding beneath the dura mater outside the brain will give rise to a subdural hematoma and bleeding within the brain parenchyma will is called an intracerebral hematoma so if you look at this picture you will see this is an epidural hematoma this is a subdural hematoma and this is an intracerebral hematoma now epidural hematoma subdural hematoma if you look at these these are non contrast cd scans which shows these hematomas now this is an epidural hematoma this is how an epidural hematoma would look like on a ct scan and this is how a subdural hematoma would look like on a ct scan and then bleeding beneath uh, the arachnoid mater is called subarachnoid hemorrhage so this is how the subarachnoid hemorrhage would look like in a non contrast ct scan so spontaneous apart from head injuries bleeding into brain tissues can occur in some medical conditions also we will see what these conditions are so one condition is hemorrhagic stroke that is uh, now we have blood vessels supplying the brain tissues when there's fat deposition in these brain tissues they can uh, at one point they can rupture the blood vessels uh, can rupture and give rise to strokes so this is what you call hemorrhagic stroke and then uh, tumors in your brain can give rise to strokes uh, bleeding in, into your brain tissues then hypertension whenever you have uh, high systemic blood pressure this can affect the uh, blood flow in your brain so especially when you have uh, aneurysms in the blood vessels supply in your brain now aneurysms are dilatations in the blood vessels now this is a hemorrhagic stroke if you look at this picture you will see now these are blood vessels surrounding the um, supplying the brain tissues and this is a dilatation in the uh, blood vessels surrounding uh, supplying your brain tissues so this dilatation is what you call berry aneurysm so when you have these types of dilatations in the blood vessels supplying the brain whenever there is hypertension these 
dilatations can rupture and can start to bleed. So these are medical conditions that can give rise to bleeding inside your brain. So one condition is hemorrhagic stroke that is rupture of blood vessels in your brain causing intracerebral bleeding. Then rupture of brain tumors can give rise to intracerebral bleeding. Whenever you have ruptured aneurysms, uh, they can, especially when there's high blood pressure, they can rupture and it can start to bleed into the brain tissues. So these are some other conditions, non-traumatic medical conditions where bleeding can occur into your brain tissues. So now we'll see how these intracranial hemorrhages are diagnosed. So the definitive investigation to diagnose intracranial hemorrhage is non-contrast CT scan. So you call it NCCT. So this is how you do a non-contrast CT scan. And here it's a picture of a non-contrast CT showing bleeding into your brain, bleeding into the brain tissues right so now we'll see how the traumatic brain injuries are diagnosed now we know the different mechanisms of traumatic brain injuries we know what type of injuries uh, these trauma will cause and now we'll see how these uh, traumatic brain injuries can be diagnosed so it's diagnosed based on history symptoms physical examination findings and then based on some investigation findings. So first we'll see the signs and symptoms of traumatic brain injury. Now physically these are the symptoms. There will be headache, nausea, vomiting, uh, there will be problems with balance, the patient will feel imbalanced, then there will be dizziness, lightheadedness, visual disturbances, fatigability, then there will be sensitivity to light, uh, sensitivity to noise, then the numbness or tingling sensation, right? And uh, yes, so then the cognitive symptoms, what are they? The patient may feel low, confused, poor concentration. He may, it may be difficult for him to remember things. He may not remember what happened uh, during the event and just before the event. Right? So he may be confused whenever you ask questions, he will answer very slowly, not like a normal person and he may keep on repeating questions. So uh, these are the cognitive changes that can occur as a result of head injuries. Then what are the emotional um, symptoms? There will be irritability, there will be sad, uh, there will be more emotional than other people and nervous. Then there can be sleep disturbances as well. So there can be drowsiness. They may find it difficult to fall asleep, right? Or sometimes they may sleep unusually longer periods of time. So these are uh, different signs and symptoms of traumatic brain injury. Now these are the physical examination. Uh, what you do what you have to do in case of a traumatic brain injury the physical assessment of a traumatic brain injury patient so it's a b c d e since it's an emergency so a is airway and cervical spine control b is breathing c for circulation next you have to assess the vital signs that is pulse blood pressure temperature and respiratory rate so a b c next comes the d d is for disability that is neurological assessment. So there are two ways in which you can assess the uh, baseline consciousness or neurological status of the patient. One is AVPU method. And next is Glasgow Coma Scale. Then you have to check the size and the response of the pupil. And you have to check for the motor movements of hands, feet and body. So this is how you do the neurological assessment. The two easiest ways are AVPU method and the Glasgow Coma Scale. Apart from that, you have to also check the pupils of the eyes for size and response. 
and then you have to check the motor movements of hands, feet and the body. So we'll say GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale. What is that? That's a commonly used neurological assessment method in adults. This is usually used in adults. In children, there are other coma scales which are uh, being used. So in Glasgow Coma Scale, we assess three things. One is the eye opening verbal response that is the ability of the patient to speak next we check for the motor response so the maximum GCS score is 15 in a normal healthy adult the GCS score will be 15 the minimum score is 0 remember even if the person is dead the score will be not 0 it will be 3 so we will see why that is now this is your GCS Glasgow Coma Scale, the different parameters. I've told you we check three parameters. We check for eye opening, we check for the verbal response, and then we check the motor response. So in case of eye opening, we check whether the person can open eye spontaneously when we ask him to do so. So if so, we give him a score of four. If he opens his eyes to pain, score is three. If there's no response, the score is if, if the person opens his eyes spontaneously, the score is 4. If the eyes are open in response to, uh, when we ask the patient to open the eyes, if he opens, then we give a score of 3. If he opens his eyes in response to pain, that is 2. If there is no response, the score is 1. And then we check for the ability of the patient to speak. Uh, we check his speech. So if he is well oriented, the score will be 5. If he has confused conversation, score is 4. If he uses inappropriate words, score is 3. Incomprehensible sounds, incompre incomprehensible sounds are heard, then the score is uh, 2. And if there is no response at all, the score will be 1. So then we check for the motor response. So if the patient obeys to commands, the score is 6. If he localizes pain, score is 5. If he withdraws limbs in response to pain, then the score is 4. If there is abnormal flexion of limbs, score is 3. If there is abnormal extension, the score is 2. If there is no response at all, the score is 1. So you can see for eye opening, the maximum score is 4. Minimum score is 1. For verbal response, the maximum score is 5 and the minimum score is 1. For best motor response, the maximum score is 6, minimum score is 1. Therefore, the maximum GCA score a person can get is 4 plus 5 plus 6, that is 15. The minimum score, uh, minimum GCA score, GCA score for a person is 1 plus 1 plus 1 that is 3 so that is why we say the maximum GCA score is 15 and the minimum score is 3 and not 0. So we'll see what happens to the GCA score in a traumatic brain injury. Now in case of primary brain injury now we know primary brain injuries are when uh, at the time of Trauma when the brain tissues are damaged, that is what we call primary brain injury. So in primary brain injury, soon after the injury, if you check the patient's GCS, you will see it is less than 15. Now in secondary brain injury, soon after trauma, if you check the patient's GCS, you will see he has got the uh, perfect GCS score of 15. But later on, if you check, you will see the GCS is reducing. So that's how you uh, identify brain injuries as primary or secondary. Now, depending on the GCS score, according to severity, the head injuries can be categorized as mild, moderate and severe head injuries. So if the GCS score is between 12 to 15, you call it mild head injury or mild traumatic brain injury. If the GCS score is between 8 to 12, you call it moderate head injury. 
if GCA score is less than 8, you call it severe head injury. So all head injury patients, it's better if they can be managed in a neurological unit. But if the facilities are not uh, available to treat all the head injury patients in a neurological unit, at least always uh, the severe head injury patients with a GCA score of less than 8 have to be treated in a neurological unit. Right, so now we will see some complications of head injuries. So it can cause cerebral edema, seizures, seizures are fits. So if it is one fit and then it stops, it's called a seizure. Sometimes with when people have uh, head injuries and brain scarring, they can have recurrent seizures. They can, uh, several times they can have, uh, recurrently they can have fits. So these are called convulsions. The recurrency, the tendency to have recurrent seizures is called convulsions. Then there will be vomiting, leakage of CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Now we know cerebrospinal fluid uh, is a fluid that runs in the subarachnoid space uh, surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. So whenever there is an injury to the head, the CSF can leak out. So they can come out through your ear and through the nose. So when it comes out through the ear, you call it CSF otoria and when it comes out through the nose, it's called CSF rhinorrhea. So these are all complications of head injuries. Right, so now we'll see injuries to your face. So trauma to the face, it can cause injury to the eyes, injury to nose, ears, facial bones, dislodgement of teeth, hematoma formation, and injuries to soft tissues in the face. So the problem with injury to face is we have the nose located in the face. So therefore, injuries to face they can cause airway obstruction. So when it causes airway obstruction, the patient will find it difficult to, difficult to breathe. So this is life threatening. So that's the problem with trauma to the face. So here are some uh, injuries to the eyes. Nail has gone in. A fishing hook has gone in. So these are all bleeding. The conjunctival bleeding. So these are injuries to eyes so injury to nose so it could be blunt trauma to the nose causing a fracture in the nasal bone or it could be injury to soft tissues in the nose so whenever it is an injury to the soft tissues in the nose it can start to bleed so this bleeding from nose is called epistaxis so epistaxis is the medical term for bleeding from the nose sometimes in case of head injuries CSF can come out through the nose. So this is called CSF rhinorrhea. So if you look at this picture, you can see there's an injury to the nose causing epistaxis. So whenever there's bleeding from the nose as a result of soft tissue injury, this bleeding has to be controlled. So there are two ways you can control this bleeding. One is to apply compression. That is, now this is the soft part of the nose. If you compress above the soft part of the nose, it may help to reduce the bleeding. The other way is to apply a nasal dressing. So now we'll see injury to ears. Now, injury to ears will not cause much bleeding. But whenever there's an injury to an ear, you have to do a proper bandaging uh, with uh, with a dressing placed between the ear and the scalp and send the patient to the hospital. Now in case of evulsion of the ear, now last time in trauma and emergency part 1, we discussed about evulsion. So what do you mean by evulsion? When part of, when partly uh, some tissue is removed from the body, that is called evulsion. So if there is an evulsed ear, what you should do is you have to wrap that part, that evulsed part in a moist sterile dressing and send the patient to the hospital now sometimes during accidents uh, some foreign bodies can enter 
into the ear canal. So in that case, you should not put uh, objects into the ear and try to take the foreign body out. So if you try to do that, sometimes it may further dislodge the uh, foreign body. So as it is, you have to uh, send the patient to the hospital. So injury to facial soft tissues. So face also has got a rich blood supply and therefore whenever there is an injury to your face, it can start to bleed profusely. Sometimes the skin flaps may be peeled off from the underlying tissues and there will be hematoma formation. So this is a uh, injury to the soft tissues on the face. So these are all injuries to soft tissues on the face. So injuries to soft tissues on the face can give rise to hematoma, especially in case of blunt injuries. It can cause hematoma. Why? There's no opening. There's no breach. There's no break in the skin. So the blood that uh, whenever there's a blunt injury, blunt trauma to the face or anywhere in the body, the blood vessels are damaged. So it starts to bleed. But if there's no uh, break in the skin this blood will not come out then what happens is this blood gets accumulated in the tissues so this is what you call hematoma so if you look at this picture you will see these are all hematomas formed on the face so now we'll see facial fractures so a direct blow onto the nose can give rise to fracture of the nasal bone uh, other features of fractures to facial bones are there will be bleeding into your mouth, loose teeth, movable bone fragments in the face. These are all indicative of facial fractures. So uh, the fractures around the face and mouth, fractures in the face can give rise to deformities. And when they swell, the problem is they can obstruct the airway. So if there's dislodged teeth, what should you do? You have to preserve them in saliva and send it with the patient to the hospital. The problem with dislodged teeth is if it enters into the air passage, it can uh, obstruct breathing. Now we'll see trauma to the neck. So it includes blunt injuries to the neck, penetrating injuries to the neck and injuries to the cervical spine. So you look at this picture, it's a knife stab injury to the neck. So first we'll see blunt injuries to the neck. So blunt injuries to the neck can cause crushing of the trachea and the larynx. So then your airways are obstructed, the patient will find it difficult to breathe. Sometimes these structures, now they are made up of bones and cartilages. So when they are uh, severely compressed, they can fracture. So if they fracture, now, these are air pipes, so air passes through them. So, this air can leak out into the, skin, uh, into the tissues beneath the skin. So, uh, the air, when leaks out into uh, the tissues beneath the skin, this is what you call subcutaneous emphysema. In that case, the patient will feel a lot of breathing difficulties so due to complete uh, airway obstruction the patient has to immediately be transported to the hospital without any delay so now we'll see penetrating injuries to the neck now penetrating injury is like now if you look at this picture you can see a knife stab injury to the neck so the knife the sharp uh, what do you call the cutting edge of the knife has entered has pierced all the structures and entered into your neck so it can damage the structures that are there in your neck like your airways esophagus and the spinal cord and can start to bleed profusely especially in the neck we have a lot of blood vessels so when they're damaged they can start to bleed profusely so in that case what you should do is you have to apply pressure to control bleeding you have to put a occlusive dressing around the neck uh, if the stabbed object is still there on the nest on the on the neck 
you should not try to remove it. What you should do is you have to secure the dressing in place and send the patient to the uh, hospital. Right, so this shows injury to your, uh, this is now uh, in the spinal, now our nervous system has got uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. It's, those are the two main components of our nervous system. So the central nervous system consists of brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system, it comprises of the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. So when it comes to the peripheral nervous system, the spinal part of the peripheral nervous system lies in the, uh, sorry, the cervical spinal, uh, the cervical part of the spinal cord lies in the neck. So whenever there is a damage to the neck, it can cause damage to the, to this uh, cervical portion of the spinal cord. So injury to cervical spine. So injury to the neck can cause injury to the cervical spa part of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves arising from the cervical region of the spinal cord right okay so now we'll see the mechanism of spinal injury so it could be from road traffic accidents like motor vehicle crashes or motorcycle crashes or pedestrian motor vehicle collisions it could be due to falls blunt or penetrating trauma to the neck or it can occur during hanging or manual strangulation of the neck and sometimes during recreational uh, accidents like what uh, in some amusement parks certain things which you do can cause injury to the spine uh, can cause spinal injuries then uh, sometimes small children they may try to imitate uh, what they have seen on TV, Tarzan like uh, adventurous things which they have seen on TV and this can uh, cause spinal injuries sometimes. Okay. So now comes to the practical and skills session. So this is the assessment for state and transportation in case of head and cervical spine injuries. So this is what you should do. So you usually do a primary assessment resuscitate the patient, re-evaluate the patient, do a secondary survey, re-evaluation and transfer for definitive care. So we'll see the emergency medical care for head and spinal injury. So it's A, B, C, D, E. A stands for airway and cervical spine control, B for breathing, C for circulation, D for disability, that is neurological assessment, E for exposure that is you examine the whole body for any life-threatening injuries or any other injuries then you have to stabilize the spine and transport the patient to the hospital without any delay so a is airway and cervical spine control b is breathing so this is what you should do you have to establish a patent airway and proper ventilation by doing these things jaw thrust manual manual inline immobilization you have to place a cervical collar for spinal stability so if there are any mucus blood or anything obstructing the airways you have to do a suction clearance of the airway and give the patient high flow oxygen and you have to continue uh, ventilation until the patient is transported to the hospital C for circulation. So this is what you should do with regard to circulation. If you see any visible bleeding, you have to apply direct pressure to control this bleeding. So this can be done by applying a compression bandage or a dressing. Next, if the patient is vomiting, you have to put the patient to left lateral position, the recovery position. And then if the patient is going into a cardiac arrest due to severe bleeding, then you will have to give CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Immediately, you have to transport the patient to the hospital because the patient is losing a lot of blood. You have to give this blood from outside by blood transfusion. So to do that, you have to uh, get the patient to the hospital. 
uh, while at the same time sometimes you may be able to do a cannulation and start IV fluids while the patient is being transported to the hospital in order to prevent the patient from progressing into a state of hypovolemic shock. Next comes to D, that is, that is disability or neurological assessment. So this is what you should do. You have to assess the patient's level of consciousness. So this can be done by several methods. One way is AVPU method. That is, you assess A is for alertness, C for conscious, uh, V is for verbal response. If the patient responds to, uh, responds verbally, that is called uh, verbal response. V. Then comes to P. P is when the patient responds to pain, that is called uh, P and then U stands for unresponsiveness. So the AVPU method is an easy method to assess the patient's neurological status. The next way to assess the patient's neurological status is by GCS score. So based on the GCS score also you can grade the patient into uh, mild, moderate and severe head injury categories. Next, we'll see how the cervical spinal, uh, spinal cord stabilization is done. So you have to apply a cervical collar for cervical spinal stability and then you have to apply a backboard for uh, spinal stability. So application of a cervical collar, this is what you should do. You have to select the appropriate size of the collar. You have to maintain manual inline immobilization and then you have to uh, apply the collar around the neck and once it is applied you have to check whether it's uh, whether it fits well so this is what you should do you have to uh, select the appropriate size of the cervical collar maintain manual inline immobilization and then apply the collar around the neck once it is applied you have to check whether it's fitting now here are the steps in applying a Philadelphia neck collar. Now we'll see application of backboards for spinal stability. Now there are two types of backboards. One is the Kendrick extrication, yeah, extrication device. Kendrick extrication device that is applied to patients in sitting position. Then we have the spinal board that is applied to patients in supine position for full immobilization. So this is a uh, Kendrick extrication device and this is the spinal board for full body immobilization. Preparation for transportation. So this includes preparation of patients in supine position for transportation, preparation of uh, patients in sitting position for transportation, preparation of patients in standing position for transportation. So first we'll see how the patients in supine position are prepared for transportation. So you have to maintain manual inline immobilization. You have to log roll the patient. So this will include, uh, you may need the help of several team members to log roll the patient onto the spinal board. Uh, because one will have to hold the head, one has to hold the back of the shoulders, one will have to hold the chest, one will have to hold the pelvis and another one will have to hold the legs. So once the patient is held like that, the patient will have to be log rolled onto the, like a log rolling manner, how you roll a log, uh, a tree log, you have to roll the patient onto the spinal board, that's log rolling patient. Secure the patient onto the spinal mod, board and then you have to assess the patient for motor sensory functions of the extremities and uh, not just once, you have to keep on checking that several times, periodically from time to time. So this is what you do, manual inline immobilization, log rolling onto the spinal board, securing the patient with straps on the spinal board and then you have to assess the patient for uh, motor sensory functions. Now we'll see how the patients in sitting position have to be prepared for transportation. So this is what you should do. You have to maintain manual inline immobilization. You have to apply a 
is like a column. You apply a short board behind the patient, then you position the uh, device around the patient, turn the patient lower onto the ground, and then you bring the short and long uh, backboards together and you have to reassess the patient for pulse, motor and sensory function. So this is what you do. Manual inline immobilization, short board, bringing a uh, turn and bringing the patient to a lower position and then securing the two boards and assessing for uh, pulse, motor and sensory functions. Next we'll see how the patients in standing position are prepared for transportation. So this is what you should do. You have to stabilize the head and neck of the patient by applying a cervical collar. After that, you have to position the board behind the patient. Next, you have to lower the patient carefully onto the ground and secure him on a spinal board. So this is what you do. Now, when it comes to accidents in children, uh, the pediatric needs in transportation to the hospital. This is what you should be done. This is what you should do. Uh, now, if the child, now say if it is a motor vehicle accident and the child is in a car, a child's seat, child's car seat, you have to uh, try to immobilize the patient in the car seat itself, if possible. While doing that, you may have to apply a lot of padding between the seat and the child to ensure immobilization of the uh, child. So this is what you should do. Now, uh, if you check the statistics, you will see motorbike accidents are now on the rise. So daily, uh, even if you watch news, you can see a lot of motorbike accidents are being reported. So during these motorbike accidents, now we always encourage the motorbike riders to wear helmets to um, reduce the risk of head injury. But sometimes when they uh, face accidents, the pa patient will be, the bike rider will be uh, still wearing the helmet. So in that case, you will have to remove the helmet uh, in order to provide him first aid uh, before transferring him to the hospital. So this is how you determine whether or not to remove the helmet because in some cases you may be able to uh, uh, ensure the patient's uh, airway and breathing and cervical spine control with the patient wearing the helmet. So in that case you need not remove the helmet but in other cases you will have to remove the helmet of the motorbike rider. So this is how you determine whether or not you have to remove the helmet. So you should not try to remove the helmet as long as it does not cause any breathing or airway problems and uh, the assessment can still be done with the helmet on and if it provides uh, proper spine if it provides enough space for uh, spinal immobility then this is when you have to remove the helmet now sometimes uh, when it causes airway obstruction or if the spinal cord stability cannot be maintained then you will have to remove the helmet so when you're trying to remove the helmet you will need at least two people so one, now if you look at this picture, you will understand it better. So we'll say we have two people, person A and person B. So this is person A. So person A will open the face shield and then he will hold the neck to uh, in order to make sure the head does not move. Then patient, uh, the person B will slip the helmet off halfway. Then again, the pa person A will slide the hands behind the head and will hold the occiput and then what happens is person B can slowly remove the helmet. So once the helmet is removed you have to stabilize the spine, apply a cervical collar with appropriate padding and send the patient to the hospital. 
So all this time we had been discussing about trauma uh, to the cranium, so which includes uh, trauma to the head and face as well as the neck, the cranial, uh, facial and neck trauma. So now we are going to discuss about trauma to the thorax. So remember thorax contains vital organs like your heart and also lungs and a lot of blood vessels. Therefore, chest injuries can bleed a lot. It can damage your vital organs and the patient can die within minutes to hours. And in most countries, the thoracic trauma, trauma to the chest accounts for about 25% of traumatic death. So first we will see the anatomy of the thorax. So this is the thoracic cavity. You can see the chest is protected by the rib cage. So inside the rib cage you have organs like the two lungs, the heart in between and the blood vessels. Therefore whenever there is a trauma to the chest it can damage all these organs. So now we'll see the mechanism of thoracic trauma. These are the mechanisms. It could be due to blunt trauma to the chest. That is, the skin is not open, but there is trauma from outside onto the chest wall causing a closed chest injury. Or it could be a penetrating trauma to the chest. Now if you look at this picture, you can see uh, there's a heat onto the chest from outside but there is no opening on the skin. So this is called a closed chest injury due to blunt trauma to the chest. Now, if you look at this picture you will see these are all penetrating trauma to the chest. So these are the signs and symptoms of chest injuries. So there will be pain at the site of the injury. Uh, the pain will be aggravated during breathing and coughing then there will be bruising that is reddening of the chest wall due to bleeding beneath the skin then there will be shortness of breath uh, when the lungs are damaged the blood can come out through the airways so that the patient can cough up blood so this is called hemoptysis then uh, the patient will find it difficult to uh, breathe normally so there will be problems with chest expansion during respiration there will be weak rapid pulse low blood pressure and due to lack of oxygen in blood and more carbon dioxide in blood this more carbon dioxide will give rise to a bluish discoloration around the lips and in the skin so this is called cyanosis so here are the complications of chest injuries pneumothorax hemothorax, rib fractures, flail chest, lung contusions or pulmonary contusions, traumatic asphyxia, blunt myocardial injuries, pericardial tympanadi and laceration of great vessels. So first we will see pneumothorax. Now this is what we call pneumothorax. Now if you look at this picture you will see now these are lungs. So surrounding the lungs, we have two layers of pleura. The one which is attached to the lung wall is called the visceral layer of pleura. Out to that, we have the parietal layer of pleura. So in between these parietal and visceral layers of pleura, there is a small space. This is called the pleural space. So the pleural space will contain a small amount of fluid. But in pneumothorax, what happens is there is air accumulation inside this pleural space. So pleural space is the cavity surrounding the heart. So therefore whenever there is air inside the pleural space it will cause compression over the lungs. So then the lungs will get compressed. So this is not good because when the lungs are compressed the patient will not be able to uh, breathe in the normal amount of air. So this is going to be dangerous. So there are two types of pneumothorax. One is called open pneumothorax. The other one is called tension 
pneumothorax. So this is what happens in open pneumothorax. So open pneumothorax, what happens is whenever there is a uh, an injury in the chest wall, piercing the skin and the structures below the skin, extending up to the pleural space, through this opening, air can enter into the pleural space. So air will enter into the pleural space and will make the pleural space to enlarge in size due to excess air accumulation. So this condition is called open pneumothorax. So open pneumothorax could be due to rib fractures causing any puncture in the lungs or the bronchus or it could be in case of penetrating chest trauma when you um, seal off all sides of the injury with dressing so that there's no way for the air to escape out then again it can give rise to open pneumothorax so when there's open pneumothorax what you should do is you have to check the airway uh, clear the airway if there's any blood or mucus then you have to give him oxygen you have to do dressing you have to dress the bone uh, but you have to keep one flutter valve for the air to exit so this is what you should do so that's in open pneumothorax. So open pneumothorax is caused by an injury to your chest wall that extends up to the pleural space, causing air from the outside to get accumulated inside the pleural space. So the second type of pneumothorax is called tension pneumothorax. So this is what happens in tension pneumothorax. So in tension pneumothorax, uh, what happens is, through an opening, through an injury, uh, due to an injury to lung tissues, there is release of air from the lungs into the pleural space, causing this air to accumulate inside the pleural space. So then the lungs will gradually compress. So this is a surgical emergency. So these are the symptoms. There will be shortness of breath, distended neck veins, Trachea will deviate to the opposite side. There will be tachycardia, low blood pressure, and due to low oxygen and high carbon dioxide, there will be uh, problems. Due to high carbon dioxide, there will be uh, cyanosis, and due to low oxygen, uh, it can cause unconsciousness if the patients, if the blood flow to the brain reduces drastically, if the oxygen in the brain tissues reduce drastically. And when you auscultate with a stethoscope, you will see the lung sounds are reduced. So this is how you manage the patient. So if uh, the patient has got a chest wound that is all dressed up, you have to partially remove the dressing in order to allow the air to escape. In other cases of tension pneumothorax, what you do is call the surgical management of tension pneumothorax is called needle thoracostomy. So this is what you do. You insert a wide bore cannula through the second intercostal space to release the air. Then what is hemothorax? When air accumulates inside the pleural space, you call it pneumothorax. When blood accumulates inside the pleural space, this is called hemothorax. So in hemothorax, uh, there's blood accumulation inside the pleural space. When blood and air both accumulates inside the pleural space, the condition is called hemopneumothorax. So this is how you diagnose hemothorax or pneumothorax. By doing a chest x-ray, you may be able to see the air inside the pleural space uh, in pneumothorax and then blood inside or the fluid inside the pleural space in hemothorax and air fluid level in case of pneumothorax. Same if you do a CT scan of the chest you will see the air fluid levels in hemopneumothorax and excess, air, excess uh, fluid inside the pleural space in case of hemothorax. So this is how you manage. The management is by inserting a chest drain or an intercostal tube which will drain out the excess fluid that is there inside the pleural space. Now we'll see rib fractures. So 
the third to tenth ribs are commonly fractured. So the problem with rib fracture is that these fractured rib segments, these fractured rib particles, the bone ends of the fractured ribs can go and contuse the lungs. So uh, whenever there is lung contusion, breathing when the patient is breathing or when the patient coughs up, the pain is aggravated. So the patient uh, finds it difficult to breathe. So that's the problem with rib fracture. So whenever there's a rib fracture, most of the time the patient will be holding that affected side of the chest to reduce the pain. And another complication of rib fracture is that if the lower ribs are fractured, it can cause damage to abdominal organs. So if the right lower ribs are fractured, it can damage the liver. If the left lower ribs are fractured, it can damage the uh, spleen. So this is how the rib fractures are managed. So remember, there's no surgical fixation uh, recommended for the rib fractures except in case of flare chest, which we'll be discussing later. So what you do is you try to reduce the pain by giving analgesics and intercostal nerve blocks. Then you strap the chest for immobilization. And since the patient finds it difficult to breathe, you have to provide the patient with breathing exercises or chest physiotherapy. So with these measures, usually the rib fractures will improve in, two we in several weeks time. Now we'll see flail chest. This is the only, this is a form of rib fracture. And this is the only indication for surgical fixation of rib fractures. So this is when three or more ribs on the say on three or more consecutive ribs on the same side of the chest are fractured resulting in a detached chest segment so these are the sign symptoms there will be paradoxical chest movements that is during inspiration the chest wall will move out but this detached segment will move in during expiration the chest wall will move in the detached segment will move out. So opposite is paradoxical. So opposite chest movements will be shown by the detached rib particles. Then there will be severe chest pain which is aggravated by coughing and breathing. There will be shortness of breath. And because of breathing difficulty, there will be low oxygen saturation of blood and cyanosis. So this is a flail chest. You can see. In this picture, it shows four ribs on the same side of the chest. Consecutive four ribs have fracture, fractured, resulting in a detached chest segment. So this is what you call flail chest. And this is the paradoxical chest movement shown by the flail chest segment. So during inspiration, the chest cavity moves out, but the uh, flail segment moves in. Now, expiration, the chest the ribs will move in back to its normal position, but the flail segment, it moves out. So this is called paradoxical chest movement. So this is how the flail chest is managed. You have to maintain airway, provide oxygenation or ventilation, and you have to do an ongoing assessment for pneumothorax and other respiratory complications like lung contusions. You have to immobilize the flail chest by applying a uh, by proper strapping of the chest and send the patient to the hospital for definitive management which is surgical fixation right so now we'll see lung contusion so contusion is a bruising or bleeding onto the surface so lung contusion is when there's bleeding onto the surface of the lung so what happens is uh, the alveoli, when there's bleeding of the, in the lungs, this blood and fluid will track down to the alveoli. So there will be edema causing difficulty in oxygenation. So these are the causes. It could be due to rib fractures, flail chest, multiple deceleration forces, right? Or it could be due to blast injuries. So mostly these lung contusions are found in... Uh, victims of motor vehicle collision, motor vehicle accidents. So you have to 
treat the patient with oxygen and ventilatory support. Now we will see traumatic asphyxia. What is that? So traumatic asphyxia is when there is a sudden severe compression of the uh, chest causing it difficult to breathe. So that's what you call traumatic asphyxia. So the problem is when there's severe compression, sudden severe compression of your airways or in the chest, it will increase the pressure inside the chest. So this will cause dilatation of your neck veins and tracking of blood into the eyes. So immediately you have to provide oxygen, one to the vital signs and uh, transport the patient to the hospital because it can cause severe breathing difficulty due to which the patient can die. Now we'll see blunt myocardial injuries. What are they? So that's a bruising of the muscles in the heart. So there'll be complications with the cardiac function. There's no pre-hospital management. You have to send the patient to the hospital for definitive management while uh, the patient is being transported. You have to constantly check the patient's pulse uh, and his BP. And at the same time, you have to provide the patient with oxygen uh, and ventilatory support. Now we will see pericardial tamponade. What is that? So when blood or fluid gets accumulated inside the pericardial space, the space surrounding the heart, this is the pericardial space. So if the blood or fluid gets accumulated inside the pericardial space, this is called pericardial tamponade. So when there's pericardial tamponade, these are the symptoms and signs. If you auscultate with a stethoscope for heart sounds, you will see the heart sounds are felt very soft and muffled. There will be low blood pressure, weak pulse and there will be distension of the neck veins. So you have to give oxygen, assess the patient for vital signs and check, uh, send the patient to the hospital immediately for the definitive management which is needle pericardiosynthesis. So if you look at this picture, this is what you call needle pericardiosynthesis. So you insert a 16 or 18 gauge uh, needle at the zifi-costal junction, the junction between the zifoid process of the sternum and the cartilage, the rib, cartilage of the rib and uh, into the pericardial space directed towards the shoulder tip and you drain the excess fluid out. So this is called needle pericardiosynthesis and this is the definitive management of uh, pericardial tamponade. Next, laceration of great vessels. That is, we know uh, in the chest we have a lot of uh, vessels, blood vessels like superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, we have pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins and aorta and a lot of other blood vessels. So, whenever there is an injury to the chest, these blood vessels can start to bleed. So, this bleeding can often be fatal and therefore, you may have to provide the patient with ventilatory support. You may have to give CPR and transport the patient immediately to the hospital because the lost fluid has to be, the lost blood volume has to be restored and at the same time, the damage has to be corrected. So now we'll see the assessment of thoracic trauma. This is what you should do. So the initial assessment of thoracic trauma is this. First of all, you have to do a scene size up. You have to assess the danger and the mechanism of injury. Next, you have to airway and cervical spine control. So head tilt, shin lift, jaw thrust, manual inline immobilization, cervical collar and spinal stabilization. Next, you have to check for breathing. So you have to check for breathing sounds, by auscultation, strider, shortness of breath, cyanosis, any tracheal deviations, any uh, penetrating chest wounds, uh, that is open chest wounds, then any subcutaneous crepitations due to subcutaneous emphysema, then you have to check for distended neck veins, paradoxical chest movements in case of flail chest segments, and then you have to assess for 
upper abdominal injuries which could occur in rib fractures next you have to check for circulation so you have to check pulse blood pressure uh, pulse oximetry vital signs and then skin color and temperature and heart sounds additional considerations these are the pattern of aberrations on the chest and the wound size and location the wounds have to be uh, dressed and the patient has to be sent to the hospital so steps of secondary assessment of thoracic trauma you have to assess pain you have to obtain the patient's opinion or the bystander's opinion about the injury in order to get an idea about the mechanism of injury next you have to determine the time of the injury you have to determine whether the patient remembers the events right so should you encounter any thoracic trauma patient this is what you should do as therapeutic intervention you have to maintain the patient's air you have to promote adequate ventilation you have to provide high flow oxygen you have to prepare the patient for endotracheal intubation next you have to cover the open chest wounds you have to assist the patient with chest tube insertion or uh, needle decompression in case of tension pneumothorax you have to monitor bleeding from the chest insert two white book annulars and start iv fluids you have once the patient is um, transferred to the hospital radiographs have to be the x-rays have to be taken of cervical spine chest and then ultrasound scan of the abdomen and pelvis you have to check for the cardiac uh, you have to ch constantly check do the cardiac monitoring you have to pay uh, check the patient's pulse blood pressure oxygen saturation and level of consciousness you have to check the patient's fluid intake output chart so that's about assessment of patients with trauma to the chest. So now we'll see trauma to the abdomen. So abdomen, first of all, we'll see some anatomy of the abdomen. So we know abdomen is divided into four quadrants and nine, four quadrants, the upper and outer quadrant, uh, uh, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, uh, right lower quadrant and the left lower quadrant and then the abdomen is divided into nine regions so the central region is called the umbilical region above that you have the epigastric region below that you have the hypogastric region on either sides of the hy uh, epigastric region you have the right hypochondriac region and the left hypochondriac region on either sides of the umbilical region you have the right lumbar region and the left lumbar region on either sides of the hypogastrium you have the right uh, iliac region and the left iliac region in the abdomen we have some hollow organs and some solid organs so these are the hollow organs which we find in the abdomen so you have the sp uh, stomach and the intestine stomach small intestine and the large intestine then rectum anal canal and the anus then you have the gallbladder you have uh, parts of your urinary system that is uh, urinary bladder ureters and the urethra and in the female reproductive system the uterus and the fallopian tubes so these are all hollow organs in the abdomen then you have some solid organs in the abdomen also now the liver sorry liver two kidneys spleen and the pancreas so these are all and ovaries so these are solid organs in the abdomen so now we'll see the mechanism of abdominal injury so it could be due to blunt trauma to the abdomen or it could be due to uh, penetrating trauma to the abdomen so blunt trauma is when the abdomen is known from outside so there's a hit to the abdomen or injury to the abdomen from outside but there's no breach in the skin so most of the time by blunt trauma the spleen and the liver can get damaged so penetrating trauma to the abdomen is when uh, the abdomen is damaged by an object which penetrates uh, the abdominal wall causing an open injury so blunt trauma to the abdomen these are the injury patterns so it could be due to rib fractures 
for example when the right lower ribs fracture it can cause damage to the liver when the left lower ribs fracture it can cause damage to the spleen when the anterior pelvic fracture anterior part of the pelvis fractures it can cause damage to the bladder and the urethra if there's a lumbar fracture it can cause lumbar vertebral fracture it can cause uh, injury to the small intestine and the large intestine so sometimes you may not know when you don't wear the seat belts properly that also can cause blunt trauma to the abdomen so if you don't wear the now this is the incorrect positioning of seat belts so if you wear the seat belts this way it can squeeze the abdominal organs and great vessels and sometimes it can also damage the spine during deceleration injuries when the vehicle when a moving vehicle suddenly stops you apply brakes suddenly and if the vehicle stops if the uh, seat belts are worn in the wrong way it can cause compression squeezing of the abdominal organs and can damage the spine as well so this is how the seat belts have to be worn so this is the correct positioning of the seat belts so it has to be below the anterior superior iliac spine and against the hip joint so here are the potential injury blunt trauma injuries to the abdomen features so it can cause bruising of the abdominal wall you can see the bruising here it can cause liver lacerations lacerations of the spleen laceration of the intestines tears in the mesentery rupture and tearing of kidneys rupture of the bladder and intra abdominal hemorrhage and also uh, now when all these things happen inside the abdomen whenever all these things happen then uh there is a chance of irritation of the peritoneal cavity which can mediate inflammation so these are the complications of blunt abdominal trauma so here are the signs and symptoms of blunt abdominal trauma there will be abdominal tenderness when you touch the abdomen the patient will complain of pain there will be bruising of the abdomen tachycardia low blood pressure and pale cold clammy skin that is due to Uh, poor circulation as a result of internal bleeding abdominal bleeding intra abdominal bleeding right so this is what you should do in case of blunt abdominal trauma you have to protect the patient's airway you have to administer oxygen using a non rebreathing mask and you have to monitor the patient's vital signs do the physical examination of the abdomen inspection palpation percussion and auscultation starting from a quadrant where the patient does not feel pain and you have to long, long roll the patient uh onto a spinal board in supine position into a supine position and then you have to keep the patient warm uh provide oxygen and ventilatory support and transport the patient immediately to the uh, hospital to the emergency and trauma department in the emergency and trauma department you will have to do diagnostic investigations like ultrasound scan of the abdomen and pelvis ct scan and diagnostic peritoneal lavage if any of these facilities are not available so now we'll see penetrating trauma to the abdomen So penetrating trauma may be in the form of stab injuries to the abdomen, gunshot injuries to the abdomen, or in the form of impalements. So there are always there will be a open wound in the abdomen. So when there is an open wound in the abdomen, you should not try to remove that instrument, right? And the amount of damage it causes to your internal organs depends on the uh, size of the weapon or size of the instrument that has caused the injury the length it has gone into the abdomen and uh, the angle at which it has entered the abdominal cavity so this is what you should do if a patient has got a penetrating abdominal trauma so you have to inspect now there'll be if something if an object has entered into your abdomen there will be an entrance wound as well as an exit wound so you have to look for both the front and the back of the patients for entrance and exit wounds next you have to apply dressing to all open wounds 
Now, if the object is still in place, you should not try to take it out. So you have to put a bandage stabilizing it and uh, to control bleeding and to reduce the movement. And then you have to transport the patient to the hospital. This is how you do it. Now, sometimes when there's severe laceration of the abdominal wall, it can cause evisceration. So what do you mean by evisceration? When the abdominal organs or the mesentery protrudes out through the abdomen, through the open wound in the abdomen, that is called evisceration. So in case of evisceration, you should never try to replace these organs that have come out back into the abdomen. You have to transport the patient as it is. You have to cover the area with the warm moist gauze and you have to transport the patient to uh, the emergency department immediately. This is how you do it. Okay. So now we will see some musculoskeletal injuries. So first we will have an idea about the musculoskeletal system, the anatomy of the musculoskeletal system. So muscu the skeleton helps us to move from place to place and also it provides protection to the organs inside our body. So our skeleton is made up of approximately about 206 bones. So this is the skeleton, human skeleton. So there are soft tissues attached to the skeleton. We have skeletal muscles, we have ligaments, tendons uh, attached to the skeleton. So what are ligaments? So ligaments are tough strands of tissues that fix or that hold bones together. And then we have tendons. So tendons are fibrous cords of tissues that attach the muscles to the bones. And then we have fascia. So facial compartments, these are fibrous tissues surrounding the muscles and the neurovascular structures in order to provide them support. So these are the types of musculoskeletal injuries, fractures, dislocations, sprains, strains, compartment syndrome. Okay, so first we'll see sprain. So sprain is an injury or a tearing to the ligaments. So it will present with pain, tenderness, bruising, and joint instability. So strain is a tearing of a muscle, a tendon, or both. So if you look at this, now this is a ankle sprain, and this is a tear in the calf muscle. It's a strain, strain, right? So fractures and dislocations. To cause fractures or dislocations, there have to be a significant force applied. So uh, these the different mechanisms of applying force to cause uh, fractures and dislocations could be direct blows on the bones or on the joint or it could be due to indirect forces like when you slip and fall when you're skating ice skating that's an example or it could be twist and turning. Now well, in case of now here you can see the person is uh, crushed between two vehicles. So these are ways by which fractures and dislocations can occur. So fracture, what is that? Fracture is a bro break in the bones. So broken bones are called fractures. So sometimes these fractures can uh, break through the skin. In that case you call them open fractures. Sometimes there will be a broken bone but it does not come out through the broken skin. So the skin is intact. That type of fractures are called closed fractures. Sometimes when there's a fracture, uh, there will be a small crack in the bone, but the bone is not separated into segments. So that type of fracture is called a non-displaced -di fracture. Sometimes when there's a fracture, the bone segments will get separated. So this is called a dip a displaced fracture. So displaced fractures will cause deformities and disfiguration. So here it's an open, oh sorry, it's a closed fracture. There's no skin opening through which the bone protrudes, but the bone has broken. You can see uh, the forearm is not straight. There is a uh, deformity. 
this is an open fracture you can see there's a break in the skin through which the uh, fractured bone part has come out so it's an open fracture so these are types of fractures green streak fractures comminuted fractures pathologic fractures and epiphyseal fractures so this is a green stick fracture now green stick fractures are fractures in the shaft of long bones and these are usually seen in children so here is a picture showing a green stick fracture in a child then comminuted fractures now comminuted fractures are fractures where the bone is broken into two or more segments now look at this picture this is a comminuted fracture you can see the bone is broken into two or more segments pathologic fracture now pathologic fracture is when uh, in certain conditions when the bones are weakened even if you apply only a small force the bones will easily break so this is called pathological fracture so this could occur in conditions like osteoporosis and when the bones are weakened due to uh, metastasis of cancer cells due to bone metastasis of uh, tumors or sometimes due to primary bone tumors as well so here these are pathological fractures next we'll see epiphyseal fractures now these are the parts of a long bone so this is called epiphysis here you have the epiphyseal cartilage or the growth plate this is called metaphysis this is called the shaft or the diaphysis so these are the parts of a bone long bone so epiphyseal fractures are fractures where the epiphyseal uh, plate of a long bone is involved so a fracture involving the epiphyseal plate of a long bone is what you call epiphyseal fracture so if you look at this picture you will see this is epiphyseal fracture of tibia so when there's a fracture in the epiphyseal growth plate what happens is the epiphysis is separated from the metaphysis now metaphysis is the place where you have a lot of blood vessels so this is the growing end of the uh, bone so whenever there is an epiphyseal fracture the epiphysis is separated from the metaphysis or the growing end of the bone so here are the signs and symptoms of fractures so it will cause deformity tenderness muscle guarding swelling bruising on the skin crepitus when you move the joints it will make an abnormal unusual sound crackling sound then false motion and sometimes the bony fragments may get exposed in case of open fractures and there will be pain and locked joints the patient will not be able to move the joints properly so these are the symptoms of bone fractures then what is dislocation now dislocation now joint is where several bones come together so whenever there is a disruption in the joint so that the bone ends are no longer in contact with one another this is what you call dislocation right so here you can see compared to this side you can see there is a dislocation here the shoulder dislocation this is how the shoulder dislocation would look like in a x-ray so these are the signs and symptoms of dislocation there will be deformity swelling pain tenderness and loss of joint function and also uh, impaired circulation to the limbs so here are the causes for musculoskeletal injuries so it could be due to internal causes or due to external causes so it could be due to internal causes like fractures dislocations uh, repair perfusion injuries due to prolonged compression such as compartment syndrome due to burns right or it could be due to external causes like uh, say mm, there's a wound you dress the wound the dressing is too tight so then it can uh, impair the blood supply to the muscles and can cause musculoskeletal injury the other way is uh, when you apply now there's a fracture you apply a splint to immobilize the fracture but the casting or the splint is too tight so then again uh, it can cause damage to the muscles and the bone so we will see compartment syndrome what is that 
now compartment syndrome now he is when the pressure increases inside the facial compartment what are fascia fascia are the fibrous tissues surrounding the muscles and the neurovascular structures so whenever the pressure is inside pressure inside this uh, facial compartment is increased what happens is now the muscle is beneath the fascia so whenever the pressure inside the fascia increases the muscles beneath that facial compartment will not get a proper blood supply then the muscles begin to dysfunction and sometimes they can die when the blood circulation is reduced for a long time so that is what happens in compartment syndrome so arms and legs are usually involved and compartment syndrome could be acute or chronic so if you look at this picture this is compartment syndrome in the leg so you can see here is the bone the facial compartment when the pressure increases what will happen when the muscles are all swollen the blood vessels and nerves and the uh, the tissues inside the uh, facial compartment will not get a proper blood supply and also the nerves and the blood vessels will get compressed right so that is what happens in compartment syndrome so acute compartment syndrome here are the symptoms sudden onset compartment syndrome is called acute compartment syndrome so it will present with pain pulse low pulse then inability to move numbness and pale discoloration so it could result from fractures or crush injuries so here is the treatment you should never try to elevate the limbs because if you try to elevate the limbs it can further reduce the blood flow the definitive treatment is to do a facial tommy that is to open up the facial compartment in order to release the pressure so this has to be done within 4 hours if you don't do it within 4 hours it can cause uh, severe damage to the tissues to the muscles and the nerves inside the uh, beneath the facial compartment to Uh, die. So, this decompression by facial tummy has to be done within four hours. Then, chronic compartment syndrome. That is when uh, there is compression. There is high increased pressure in the facial compartment, but it's not that severe, and it lasts for a long time. So, these are the features. There will be pain usually during exercise. When you are exercising, muscles need a good blood supply. When the blood flow is low due to this. high pressure in the facial compartment it can give rise to pain then whenever you do activities like cycling or um, running the pain will be more and the pain will be relieved by rest but remember it does not cause the chronic compartment syndrome will not cause permanent damage to your muscles like your acute compartment syndrome therefore facial tommy uh, is not an emergency so you can first give physical therapy or physiotherapy to improve the blood supply to the uh, muscles and to reduce the pressure in the facial compartment and later on if it does not improve the condition you can go for a surgery right so now we'll see uh, the grading of the musculoskeletal injuries so that is you grade the musculoskeletal injuries depending on its severity so you have minor injuries that is minor sprains fractures and dislocations of digits that is bones in the hands in the uh, fingers and toes are called digits so these are minor injuries moderate injuries these are open fractures of the digits then non displaced long bone fractures non displaced pelvic fractures and major sprains in major joints these are moderate musculoskeletal injuries then severe injuries are these displaced long bone fractures multiple hand and foot fractures open long bone fractures displaced fractures displaced of pelvic fractures dislocation of major joints multiple digit amputations when they are removed from the hand that is called amputation so multiple digit amputations and lacerations to major nerves or blood vessels then there are severe life threatening musculoskeletal injuries 
Now, certain conditions, the survival may still be possible. So, the conditions are multiple closed fractures, limb amputations, and fractures of uh, both long bones on the limb. That is, long bone of the uh, thigh compartment is the femur. So, when, whenever there is a femur fracture, it can bleed uh, heavily. So, if both the um, femur femurs get fractured, that is a severe life-threatening injury where, but still, the survival is probable. Then there are critical injuries, certain musculoskeletal injuries which are too severe so that the survival is uncertain. Examples are multiple open fractures of the limbs and uh, pelvic fractures with hemodynamic instability. Once again, the pelvic fractures can profuse bleed internally, so it can lead to hemodynamic instability in the patient. So these are critical injuries where survival is uncertain. Right, so now we will see transport decision in musculoskeletal injuries. What does it depend on? So here are the considerations. You have to provide the patient with airway and breathing support. If the patient is having, um, yeah, if, if the patient is having breathing difficulties, you have to transport the patient immediately. If the patient has got uh, injured due to a significant mechanism of injury, say uh, vehicle run over, or if it is a blast injury, or um, depending on the mechanism of injury, you will have to take the decision to transport him rapidly to the hospital. Then you have to stabilize the patient on a uh, backboard. You have to do ABC, airway breathing and circulation assessment, cervical spine control, give oxygen via a non rebreathing face mask, and then you have to transport him to the hospital. Uh, so here are some considerations. So this is how you do the assessment when you're transporting the patient to the hospital so you have to use this is the assessment to be done so you can use decap btls what is that you have to check the patient for deformities contusions abrasions or punctures then penetrations then burns tenderness lacerations and swelling so still if you don't find any external injuries you have to ask the patient to move the limb to see uh, now, if he, if there's a fracture, he'll find it difficult to move the limb. Fracture or dislocation, he may find it difficult to move the limb. But if the patient complains of pain, you should never ask the patient to move the limbs. Because if you do that, it's going to aggravate the condition. And then, again, if the patient is having back pain or neck pain, that means there's a chance of spinal injury. So... Uh, that means it's due to spinal injury. So in that case, you should never ask the patient to move the, uh, to do the movements because it can aggravate the condition. Next, you have to do a focused physical assessment of the non-significant trauma. You have to evaluate the circulation by checking pulse and blood pressure and uh, if possible pulse oximetry. Then you have to check for motor and sensory functions. Uh, then you have to transport the patient uh, if two or more bones are fractured then you have to transport the patient and at the same time you have to recheck the neurovascular function after uh, before checking the before doing the splinting as well as after uh, doing the splinting after the splinting is done in case of fractures right to make sure that the distal parts of the limbs receive a good uh, blood supply so this is how you assess the motor and sensory function during emergency so sensory function you can in the hand so you can um, using a say uh, a toothpick or any object you can tap on the uh, skin of the hand to see whether he feels and then you can ask the patient to do some hand movements like opening and closing the fist and wiggling of toes to see the motor functions are intact. And here, now in the hand, we have three nerves. It's 
supplying the hand. We have the radial nerve, median nerve, and the ulnar nerve. So this picture will give you an idea about how uh, the sensory function and the motor function of these three nerves supplying the hand can be checked in detail. And if you look at this picture, this will show how the sensory and motor uh, functions of the peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve uh, supplying the foot can be uh, checked in detail. Now, this is how the neurovascular status is assessed. So, if the patient complains of pain, you can't carry out this examination. Right? So, if there is no pain, then you can do the neurovascular examination. So, you have to check the uh, pulses proximal and distal to the injury. So, here are the pulses. Now, if you consider the limbs, in the hand closer to the wrist, we have the radial pulse and the ulnar pulse. And in the, um, at the elbow bend, you have the brachial pulse. And then in lower limbs, you have in the groin, you have the femoral pulse. Behind the uh, knee, you have the popliteal pulse. And then you have the posterior tibial pulse closer to the medial malleolus. And then you have the uh, arterial dorsalis pedis pulse. So depending on the place of injury, you have to make sure to check the pulses proximal and distal to the injury. So that is how you check the neurovascular status. The next thing you do to assess the neurovascular status is to check the capillary refill time. That is you press over the skin nail or um, sorry skin um, you press over the fingernail or the toenail and then you release the pressure. So when you release the pressure if the blood fills back into the uh, finger and the finger the the uh, whitishness disappears and the red color reappears on the nail within two seconds you call the capillary filling is normal if it is more than two seconds that means uh, the blood flow uh, to the distal parts of the limbs is not enough it's impaired so this is the emergency medical care in musculoskeletal injuries so you have to inspect and palpate the uh, extremities and the spine uh, for fractures, dislocations and sprains. You have to compare the injured limb with the opposite limb. Then you have to repeat the initial assessment and assessment of vital signs. Next, in order to uh, make the injured limbs immobilized, you'll have to apply splinting. And then you have to assess the neurovascular status proximal and distal to the injury. Then you have to do a proper documentation. You have to get the history about the mechanism of injury from the patient itself if he is able to talk or from a bystander and you have to document that. At the same time, you have to document your findings on airway, breathing and circulation, the type of fracture and uh, whether there had been any uh, circulatory compromise before uh, or after splinting. So after documenting all of these, you have to do these interventions. You have to completely cover the open wounds. You have to provide or uh, apply appropriate splinting. If there's swelling, you have to keep ice packs. And then you have to prepare the patient for transportation. So when the patient is being transported to the hospital, you have to uh, keep the hospital uh, staff informed uh, by the time the patient reaches the hospital, you have to keep them informed about the type of wounds you have encountered and the type of dressings and the splinting you have done to the patient. So now we'll see splinting. What is that? So splint is a flexible or a rigid device that is used to immobilize a, uh, an extremity. So splinting helps to prevent further injury. So... In case of all accidents, uh, if the rib fracture, if, if fractures are, uh, if any fracture is uh, suspected in any extremity, splinting has to be done prior to moving the patient, except in case of very critical injuries. So here are some general principles for splinting.
So sometimes you may not have proper splints at the site of injury, so you have to improvise splinting material. Whatever is available, you have to make make use of it to do the splinting. You have to remove clothes from the affected area. You have to record the patient's neurovascular status. If there are any open wounds, they have to be dressed. Then you have to do splinting before moving the patient unless it's a very critical patient who needs immediate transportation to the hospital. Uh, you have to immobilize the joints above and below the injured joint. Using, uh, you have to pad. Proper padding has to be done uh, whenever you're doing applying a splint. And cold packs if they're swelling. You have to apply gentle traction if needed, not always. Uh, if you find difficult to bring the limb back to its normal alignment, then you have to splint the limb as it is. And then all the time you have to maintain the patient in uh, inline immobilization uh, if you suspect spinal injuries. And if the patient shows features of shock, you need you should not try to uh, you if the patient uh, shows features of shock then you have to align the limb in its normal anatomical position and then transport the patient right whenever you are doubtful of a fracture again you have to splint so here are the steps to be done in case of inline traction splinting so inline traction splinting is when you apply traction to bring the bone back to its normal anatomical alignment, that is called inline traction splinting. So this is what you should done. You have to realign the fracture uh, back to its normal anatomical position using minimum force as much as possible and then do the splinting. Next, here are the steps to be applied when you are applying a rigid splint. So you have to provide gentle inline traction to the limb and uh, to support that you have you can use another uh, EMT board uh, and the rigid splint and you have to uh, with proper padding you have to splint the uh, extremity and once you do, do that you have to assess and record uh, the neurovascular status that is you have to check the pulse and capillary filling distal to the uh, splint These are the steps you have to follow when you are applying a zippered air splint So you have to hold the injured limb apply gentle traction and then support the injury site your then another team member can place the splint around the extremity then you have to zip the zip up the splint and inflate using the pump or using mouth and once it is done you have to check the pressure in the splint and check the uh, distal ends uh, for check distally uh, to the injury for the neurovascular function so this is how you apply an unzippered air splint so you have to support the limb place the arm through the splint to grasp the hand or the foot of the injured limb and then you have to apply gentle traction to the hand or foot while sliding the splint onto the injured limb. And then you have to inflate using a pump or using mouth, test the pressure inside the splint. And then you have to check and record the neurovascular status and the motor and sensory function. This is what you should do when you're applying a vacuum splint. So you have to stabilize and support the injury. You have to place the splint and wrap it around the limb. You have to draw the air out of the splint and seal the valve. And then you have to check for the neurovascular function. So this is what you should do when you are applying a hair traction splint. So you have to expose the limb, check pulse and smooth and sensory function. And then you have to place the splint beside the injured limb, then adjust it to the proper length and straps. and then. You have to support the injured limb uh, while another member in the team will be fastening the ankle hitch. And then you have to continue supporting the limb uh, while another member will be applying gentle inline traction. 
uh, to the anchor hitch and the foot and then you have to slide the splint onto position under the injured limb then you have to do adequate padding to the groin and fasten the istrial strap connect the loops of the anchor hitch uh, to each end of the splint uh, while another person will continue to apply traction and then what you should do is you have to carefully tighten the ratchet uh, while the traction is applied and it's adequate and then you have to secure the straps check the support straps and then you have to assess for neurovascular function then you have to secure the patient on a backboard and transport it to the hospital so this is how the steps of hairline traction application now all the time whenever there is a fracture you may not need to apply traction in some cases traction is contraindicated so these are the contraindications upper extremity certain injuries injuries closer or surrounding the knee or involving the knee then injuries to pelvis and the hip and whenever there is a partial amputation or evulsion of the bone or whenever there are injuries in the foot or ankle so these cases you should not apply traction splinting now sometimes when the splinting is not done properly it can give rise to a lot of complications so here are the complications so it can compress the nerves tissues and blood vessels so whenever when you try to when you take a long time to do the splinting it can delay uh, transportation of the patient to the hospital so it can reduce the distal circulation and sometimes uh, too tight splints can aggravate the injury and it can cause injuries to tissues nerves and blood vessels right okay so now we'll consider some fractures and dislocations of the upper limb so the first one is injury to clavicle and scapula so injuries to clavicle and scapula this includes fracture of the clavicle and acromioclavicular separation next you have shoulder joint injury like fracture of the upper end of the humerus dislocation of the humerus and then you have fractures in the humerus and then the elbow joint injuries include fractures of the lower end of the humerus and dislocation of the humerus so the fractures in the forearm it includes fracture of the radius and fracture of the ulna then injuries to the wrist and hand it includes fracture of carpal bones fracture of metacarpal bones and fracture of phalanges so first we'll look at clavicle and scapula injury so remember clavicle is usually it's a common bone that is fractured but scapula is usually well protected so scapular fractures are rare when the joint between the clavicle and the scapula is called acromioclavicular joint so during acromioclavicular joint separation what happens is the distal end of the clavicle will stick out so this is a ac separation acromioclavicular separation so the treatment of clavicle and scapula injuries is to splint uh, the injury with a arm sling so dislocation of the shoulder is the next injury so dislocation shoulder dislocation is one of the most common large joint dislocations so mostly it's the anterior dislocation of the shoulder so whenever there's a dislocation of the shoulder there will be guarding of the shoulder the patient will try to protect uh, it by holding the arm in a fixed position away from the patient so this is the treatment what you should do the first thing is to give uh, is to apply a splint and an arm sling now the fractures of the humerus so humeral fractures it can occur in the proximal part of the humerus distal part of the humerus or in the mid shaft so humeral fractures now when a humerus is fractured it can cause a lot of injuries to the blood vessels and nerves and therefore depending on the local protocols you should consider applying traction 
and then you have to uh, apply a splint and an arm sling. Uh, while doing that, always you have to do a proper padding of the splint. This is elbow joint injury. So elbow joint injury include fractures and dislocations in the elbow joint. So a lot of blood vessels and nerves can get injured. So you have to assess uh, the neurovascular stages always whenever there is a elbow joint injury and you have you may always want to do realignment sometimes uh, uh, surgical that is under anesthesia this will have to be done in order to improve the surge, uh, circulation right so these are fractures in the forearm here if you look at this picture you can see this is not straight so that's because of uh, a fracture in the forearm so fractures in the forearm includes fractures to radius and ulna. So in that case, what you should do is you have to uh, immobilize the fracture using a padded board or air vacuum or a pillow splint. Then injuries to the wrist and hand. So whenever there are injuries to the wrist and hand, if there are any open wounds, they have to be covered. Then you have to um, make the hand into its normal position and then apply a roller bandage in the palm of the hand. Apply padded board splint and sling. Now we will consider some musculoskeletal injuries in the lower limbs. So this includes pelvic fractures, dislocation of the hip, fracture of the pelvis, then knee joint injuries like injuries to the knee ligament, dislocation of the knee and fractures about the knee and also dislocation of the patella. And then fractures to the tibia, fractures to the fibula and ankle injuries and also foot injuries. So now we'll see first the fractures to the pelvis. Now remember pelvic fractures can give rise to severe bleeding. So it can be life threatening. So this is how the pelvic fra so pelvic fractures have to be assessed for tenderness. Especially now the pel when, whenever the whenever there is a pelvic fracture, sometimes these fractured bony particles they can go and uh, they can damage the bladder and the urethral meatus. So if the urethral meatus is damaged, if the urethra is damaged, it will present as blood at the meatus. So if there is uh, any bladder injury, it will present as hematuria. That is, along with urine, the patient will be passing blood. So if there are any of these symptoms, these are even more severe uh, conditions because it, these are indicative of damage to the bladder and the urethra. So this is how the pelvic fracture assessment is done. You have to check from sides, front for tenderness. Now, this is how a pelvic fracture is stabilized. So, goal is to control hemorrhage because it can cause, pelvic fractures cause life-threatening hemorrhage. And to return the pelvic bones back to its normal position to reduce the uh, pelvic volume and venous bleeding. So, this is what you should do. You have to apply compressive force. So, this is best done by using a pelvic binder so other functions of the pelvic binder includes it helps to reduce pain and to uh, and movement during transfers it helps you to move the patient to the backbone then uh, it provides some integrity to the pelvis it helps to stabilize the pelvis right so sometimes you may not have pelvic binders at the site the proper pelvic binders in that case you have to improvise the uh, what do you call splinting uh, uh, material so this is a picture that shows how a big sheet is used as a pelvic binder dislocation of the hip now for a hip to dislocate there has to be a significant force so it could be a posterior dislocation of the hip or it could be a anterior dislocation of the hip so in case of posterior hip, hip dislocations, the leg will be flexed and internally rotated. And in case of anterior dislocations of the hip, the uh, leg will be extended and externally rotated. So here's the treatment. You have to apply a splint 
and transport the patient immediately. So when you are doing that, when you are splinting, you should never try to realign the uh, hip back in its normal position. As it is, you have to splint it, stabilize it and send it to the hospital. So now we'll see fracture of the femur. So fracture of the proximal hemor, femur uh, will give rise to characteristic deformities because proximal femur helps in forming the hip joint. So the treatment is to splint the injured leg, secure the patient onto a backboard and transfer the patient into uh, rush the patient to the hospital. So here in case of femur fractures when you are splinting the legs remember the injured leg is splintered to the uninjured leg. This is how you do it. So splintered leg is splintered to the uninjured leg. Secure the patient on a backboard and transfer the patient to the hospital. So humoral shaft fractures. It can cause muscle spasms and deformities in the limb and also they can bleed significant amounts of blood. So therefore, you have to stabilize the patient with a traction splint and transport the patient to the hospital. So injuries to the knee. So knee is very vulnerable to injury. So it could be injuries to the knee ligament, it could be dislocation of the knee, it could be fractures about the knee, or it could be a dislocation to the patella, the small bone which you find in front of the knee. So injury to the knee ligament will present with pain in the joint, inability to move the leg normally. So what you should do is you have to apply a splint from hip to foot, right? And then you have to assess the distal neurovascular function. That is, you have to check the foot, the foot end for neurovascular function. Dislocation of the knee. Now, dislocation of the knee can produce significant deformity. Right? And also it can damage the popliteal artery. It can compress or lacerate the popliteal artery. And therefore, in case of knee joint dislocation, always you have to check distal pulses like posterior tibial pulse and anterior dorsalis pedis pulse for, uh, to see whether the circulation is still maintained to the distal parts of the limbs. So these are the fractures about the knee. So if there is any fracture about the knee, this is how uh, they have to be treated. So if there is distal pulse present, no significant deformity in the knee, then you have to splint the limb with knee in straight position. If there is adequate distal pulse but there is significant deformity, then you have to splint the joint as it is in the position of the deformity. If there is no pulse below the level of the injury, then you have to, it's an emergency. Popliteal artery may be severely damaged. So then um, immediately you have to call for help. So this is dislocation of the patella, the bone in front of the knee. So patella usually dislocates to a side and this can give rise to a significant deformity. So whenever there is a patella dislocation, this is what you should do. You have to apply a splint in position and uh, in as it is and then transport the patient uh, to the hospital. So you can do that with the help of uh, Hino. Right, so these are injuries to tibia and fibula. So usually tibial, tibia and fibula both get damaged at the same time. And tibular fractures are more common because tibia lies more closer to the skin. And also these fractures can give rise to significant bleeding. So what you should do is you have to stabilize the limb with a padded rigid long leg splint or an air splint uh, extending from upper thigh to foot and transport the patient to the hospital. Now we will see ankle injuries. So ankle is also a commonly injured joint. So whenever there are open wounds, you have to dress them. Then you have to assess the neurovascular status. And if there are any gross deformities, you can apply gentle uh, inline traction to the heel. 
Now, before releasing the traction, before releasing the traction, splint has to be applied. Now we will see foot injuries. Now foot injuries usually result from falls or from jumping. So most of the time, uh, in these foot injuries, depending on the force. Sometimes the force of injury can be transmitted up the legs to the spine and can uh, cause fractures to the lumbar spine. So in case of foot injuries, this is what you should do. You have to uh, immobilize the ankle and cause and uh, provide foot stabilization. While doing that, you have to make sure the toes are exposed because with the toes, uh, by capillary filling and by checking the pedis pulse, arterial dorsalis pedis pulse here on the foot, you are going to check the neurovascular function. So foot stabilization can be provided using a pillow splint or a proper or by properly bandaging the ankle to provide proper stabilization to the, you can give proper stabilization to the foot. So today in uh, trauma and emergency Part 2, we had been discussing about craniofacial and neck trauma, thoracic trauma, trauma to the abdomen, and musculoskeletal trauma. So that comes to the end of this topic. Thank you very much for listening.